So um, this is the first time we are going to talk about CLL, and I didn't know if all of us know even what CLL means. We know some leukemia, and we know a little bit about chronic leukemia, and I thought to myself, okay, if we are going to try to learn about a new type of leukemia, because there might be patients that we can support as well with our group, and this uh, group of patients right now in many of our countries have nobody that's supporting them. So I thought to myself, okay, I, it must be very similar to CML. Um, it's a leukemia, so what is a leukemia, and what does it come from, and white blood cells, and what type of blood cells. So I thought I would start by the very beginning, very simply, to set the stage so that we understand what the doctors uh, will tell us. And I think that hopefully most of us know what I'm going to say because it's very, very basic, but I thought it would be good to review before we go into CLL so we understand. So the first question I ask is, what is blood? And I think all of us think that we know what blood is. Huh? So blood is a liquid that is made up of plasma and cells. I think this is very easy, we know. I think everybody, that because you see the CBC test, and we know there's red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, three types of cells. The red blood cells carry the hemoglobin, that carries the oxygen, and that's why sometimes when we have low hemoglobin, we feel so tired. The white blood cells, we know that it help fight infections, and the platelets, they help the blood clot. Right, doctors? So far, so good? Thumbs up. Okay, <laughs> very good. All right, so do we all know where blood is formed? Blood is formed in the bone marrow and in the spleen, and that maybe explains why when we talk about CML, there's the spleen is uh, compromise, huh? there's things with the spleen. So, two places. And uh, I thought it was interesting that I read about these original cells in the bone marrow called the stem cells, are also called the mother cells. And I like that because, of course, we know about stem cell transplant, but we have to remember what stem cells are. So, I thought that was interesting to remember. Still, thumbs up? Okay, very good, very simple. Okay, do we all know what type of white blood cells exist? Do you th everybody thinks they know the types of blood, white, white blood cells? So three types, granulocytes, monocytes, lymphocytes. Huh? And I thought this was interesting because I thought to myself, okay, so where is the myeloid come, the myelocytes? And the myelocytes are these precursor cells to, to the granulocytes, right? Uh, so um, I, I think that uh, this is a good graph that reminds us there's three types of granulocytes that I don't even know if I can pronounce correctly in English, but neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, right? And so some of us know because we read the blood, the, blood, um, the blood work. And in the lymphocytes, there are B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. And then I really liked this about these natural killer cells. I, I thought that was a really nice name of some natural killer cells. Um, but you, we see that I was interested in knowing that the my, myelocytes are these precursor cells, not only to white cells, but to blood, uh, red, red cells also, right? Doctors, yes? You want to explain something, Dr. Harris? You can. <laughs> because, you're, because you're going like, hmm, yes, okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll let her say this. So you want to explain something about the myelocytes and what role they, how is it different how do they how do they form three different types of cells? Okay. Hi, can you hear me at the back? Yeah. Uh, 
actually um, the the way that we see the the production of blood cell, you can take it to one end where everything is so complicated, right. or we can actually um, look at the other end where things can be a bit more straightforward. But at the end of the day, the product and when, when we see our blood tests, we need to know what the cells do. So um, in general terms, um, the white cell as a whole, they fight against infection, but they actually fight infection in their special little ways. So when we talk about the lymphocyte, there are certain kind of infection that they cover, while the granocyte, they do slightly different things. Granocyte on its own is actually quite immature, and they mature on to become neutrophil, eosinophil, and basophil, and they become more specialized. So granocyte at the beginning, they're not really that specialized yet. Okay? And then they become more specialized when they become neutrophil, they fight against bacterial infection and things like that. So, so far, that's, that's, that's fine. That's yeah. right. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, now I was trying to explain, we know about blasts. That's another term we always know about when we know about CML. And so I was trying to remember for myself what are blasts and why is it that when blasts are in the blood, uh, we are concerned that the doctors are concerned. So maybe I will just be lazy and let the doctors explain this. Who wants to explain? <laughs> Well, basically, you can see that the blast is basically just a kind of the uh, stem cell or the mother cells, okay? So basically, we, um, when we look at the bone marrow, um, these are what we call the, uh, the when we, we usually they, they have a relatively sort of premature looking because they can actually differentiate into different kinds of red blood cells. So they actually look, you know, quite primitive, okay? They're actually the stem cells or the mother cells. And um, we are so concerned about blood cells is because if for, for some reason, these sort of stem cells, they have some, they, de they, they develop some, uh, something abnormal, okay? For example, some of the, maybe the chromosome has a change, the genetic has a change, they become abnormal. So they grow excessively and they don't sort of uh, change okay, or differentiate into the mature cells, then they become the leukemia. Okay? So in leukemia, we always say that, oh, there are a lot of blasts in the bone marrow or sometimes in the blood. Okay? Uh, this indicates that there's something wrong with this blast cell, and usually we are referring this to leukemia. Right. Okay? Everybody follows? Yes? We're ready to learn more? Okay, what is leukemia? And we think we know this also, so let's make sure. So leukemia we know is a type of cancer that starts in the bone marrow and other blood forming places like the spleen. We know that leukemia starts with one cell for some reason mutates. And then of course, uh, where does the word come from? Leuco means white, and so we know that leukemia affects the white blood cells. Yes? This is something that we all remember? And very basic. Okay, good. How many types of leukemia exist? So I learned that there are different types of leukemia. So people, the general public thinks you got leukemia, you got just, it's just one cancer leukemia, but there's many types of leukemia. So the leukemia types seem to be grouped in two different ways. One is how quickly it develops and gets worse, which is the acute versus chronic, and then what type of blood cells that it's affected. So this is about the uh, lymphocytic versus the um, myelogenous leukemia, right? So acute versus chronic, right? So acute leukemias are um, the abnormal blood cells um, are very immature and they develop very fast and in chronic uh, they develop slower but I would ask the doctors to give us a better explanation of how do you differentiate acute versus chronic leukemia. Uh, first of all yes um, Pat touched about the, the time timeline you know how long does it take before the disease evolve 
uh, between chronic and acute. But most of the time, when the chronic leukemia start to give the patients trouble, they actually transform themselves into an acute form of leukemia. So if you look at CML, for instance, there are three phases. There's the chronic phase, and then um, towards the end is actually the blast phase, and somewhere in between is the accelerated phase. In the blast phase, the patient behaves as if they have acute leukemia. There's not much difference between these two groups. But it's important to know about chronic leukemia at the beginning because that will predict the progression of the disease. And in acute leukemia, um, the problem with the patient tends to be that their normal cells are depleted much faster. So not only that, the white cell count goes up very, very quickly, similar in chronic leukemia, but at the same time, their capacity to produce the normal cell, the hemoglobin, the platelet, they lose that function very quickly. So in this group of patients, you don't have uh, time to wait. You have to act and get treatment very, very quickly. In chronic leukemia, we often find that or oh, the patient is doing okay for a few years, even without knowing that they got the disease. And even once they actually have the diagnosis, we can still have time to actually, for example, to source the, the imatinib to this patient because we know that there is time for us to actually work on. But when we talk about acute leukemia, we look at their survival in weeks rather than in months or years. So even though um, the, the cell at the end is different, the way that the disease evolves is a bit slower. But at the end of the day, uh, if the chronic patients develop acute leukemia, at the end of their disease process, the treatment is almost the same. Um, the kind of things that differentiate may be the amount of blood cell in the bone marrow in the bloodstream, and also the way that the other cells is actually affected. The kind of mutation in the cells is also different. Now in CML, we actually have a definite target. Unfortunately, we don't often have this in the acute form of leukemia or even in CLL. Okay? Right. Do, 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 yeah. You want to add? Um, yeah, I fully agree with uh, Dr. Harris, but I'll try to use an example to help you to understand, okay? Um, what's acute, what's chronic, and what's the, uh, what's the blood cells doing. Now, just like, uh, they're just like you know, uh, uh, when we have new cells being divided, say from the stem cell, it's just we're having a baby, okay? The blood cell is also something like this, and then they go to school, and then they get trained up, okay? And so, they get, well, so that's what we call the differentiation. So from a stem cell become a mature cell, they got trained. Okay, so when they train, oh, some become engineer, some become you know the uh, doctor, some become you know uh, 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 you know maybe a, a nurse, some become a uh, uh, accountant, some becomes a you know a businessman or something like that. Okay, so that's but not lawyers. Not lawyers. Okay, 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 <laughs> yeah, good. Okay, so that's why they, they when they differentiate, they, they sort of they will be trained up so they do one function. So that's why Dr. Harris mentioned with different kinds of white blood cells, they do different functions because they got trained to do a specific function. That means they make them more skillful, okay? So that they can do their job better, okay? So that's why the, the body have different kind of white blood cell. Now, the problem is that whenever we got leukemia, that means there is an abnormal and excessive growth of the cells, okay? So in chronic leukemia, to a certain extent, these cells, although they grow excessively, they still go to school. They still, still got trained up. Although, they, because they're abnormal, they're they not as smart as the other normal cells. So they, even they got trained up, they don't function as well. But still, they can go to that level. For the acute leukemia, these guys, they don't usually go to school, okay? So when they grow up, they know nothing. They don't do anything. They just keep growing, okay? So that's the problem, okay? And, and, and that's something that usually in chronic leukemia, the cell, the growth, okay, overall the cell population, the growth rate is slower. Acute, they grow much faster. So that's how we call them acute, because in the past, if you talk about 30, 40 years ago, when we don't have effective treatment for leukemia, in a patient diagnosed with acute leukemia, 
the median time of survival is something like two to three months. But for chronic leukemia, even if you don't give them treatment, they can survive for a few, quite a few years. They may be chronic CML, maybe at least three years. Even CLL, they may survive for you know, five, ten years, five years, ten years that long. So it's because of the rate that the disease actually grow. Okay, so that's how I understand the, the, the issue. And of course, the other thing is that uh, you, you may still don't understand why acute grow faster, why chronic grow slower. Now imagine, it's actually, the blood cell is actually mimicking the world. You can see that in some of these more developed worlds, you know, the family don't have a lot of kids, okay? Usually the family have one or two kids or even no kids, okay? But in some of these less developed country or developing country, you know the family is usually bigger. Okay, so if you look at from a global, from, from a more macroscopic point of view, wow, you see that population grow very fast. This one doesn't actually grow or grow slowly. Okay, so this is acute chronic. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think that they, uh, the doctors have explained this very well, and uh, so we know that myeloid leukemia affects the myeloid cells, and the lymphocytic leukemia affects the lymphoid cells, right? And so the myeloid leukemia does not really affect a white cell in that sense, right? It just a, a affects a precursor cell. Does that impact also on the production of red, white, red cells if you have myeloid leukemia? Th there is actually a subset of uh, acute myeloid leukemia that predominantly affect uh, the production of red cell. So, but it's very uncommon. So it's most likely that it's more commonly that they affect the white cell, but it's not unknown. Okay. Okay. So there are four most common types of leukemia, depending on uh, the type of cell and the, f the speed of acceleration. And these are the four. So the acute lymphocytic leukemia, as far as I know, is the one that affects the children more often, ALL. Uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia is the one we are learning today, CLL. Acute myelogenous leukemia is what it's called AML. Uh, and then uh, chronic myelogenous leukemia, which is CML, which we know so well. Mm? And there are many other types of subtypes of leukemia is what I hear, right? Okay, so CLL. I will attempt to say something about it. Uh, it's, uh, I uh, have understood that most of the time CLL affects the B cells. So there's the T cells and the B cells. So when we talk about C CLL, most of the time it affects these B cells, lym lymphocytes, right? It is the most common type of adult leukemia. It affects older adults. And uh, the B cells grow out of control and accumulate in the bone marrow and the blood, right? So is it, uh, can you, are you going to tell us um, about the age? Is the a age in Asia also in the 70s or it affects younger people than? I'm going to talk about that in my, in my okay, talk. Good, and good, uh, because good. this is what actually applies to the Western population. Right. And this doesn't actually apply to our population, Asia Pacific. Good. I'm going to elaborate on that later. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so I was trying to find out uh, what are the characteristics of a CLL patient and, and hopefully the doctors will tell us more later. But as we are attempting to learn so that we can provide services to the patients, I think it's important to understand, you know, how are the patients going to feel if they have CLL. So um, a CLL patient would be more fatigued, lose weight, have lympho lymph nodes uh, swollen, right? Become enlarged and have uh, be very prone to infections. Is that still correct? Yes. Uh, I also looked up the signs and symptoms of CLL. Um, and again, the enlarged lymph nodes, the infections, loss of appetite, abnormal bruising, uh, night sweats. And I wondered to myself, how does a CLL patient present different than a CML patient? Maybe you can. You will tell us the yeah. slides. Oh, great, <laughs> great, great, okay. Uh, what causes CLL? Still, we don't know. 
But again, just like in CML, it's important to know it is not contagious. We cannot catch uh, CLL from another person. Is it hereditary? So again, in general, it's not, but uh, I will elaborate a little bit in my talk. There has been observation that the close relative of some of these CLL patients may have a higher chance of getting the CLL. Uh, but we still we don't know what's, uh, what's the problem. And it's clearly not an inherited kind of problem. Like the father has it and all the kids will have it. It's not that kind of uh, problem. Okay. I also was hoping, because I know so much about CML and the uh, 922 chromosome said okay which chromosome am I going to find and then I it was extremely confusing to try to understand CLL there's a lot of chromosomal changes which I attempted to write here the names um, I only could uh, read that there is one that is uh, very important which is this chromosome 17p which hopefully you will tell us more about. <laughs> Are you, okay. you guys telling no. us about or you can tell us? Not in my talk, I, I can actually elaborate here to a certain extent. Um, we, we would, well, in, in an ideal world, we want a target for us to actually look at and try to actually treat, like in CML, the, the BCR-ABL uh, uh, fusion protein that comes from uh, from the translation 922, but it doesn't quite work like that in CLL, unfortunately. In CLL, there are certain genes that that will flag up that if you were to have CLL and you also have this gene, you might actually have worse. Uh, you might actually turn out worse than others. So the genes that we see and we look for in CLL are mainly uh, to look at the prognosis. So we are not using all these tools for diagnosis, but we are using these tools to actually um, to, to actually compartmentalize or put you in a group that you would need treatment now or you will have problems in two years, four years, five years, something like that. And also, it will also hopefully in the future give us a target in terms of treatment. But unfortunately, it doesn't quite work like, like in CML. And so one of the things uh, uh, I'm hoping you will discuss later is this watch and wait um, uh, non-treatment, uh, basically, right? Uh, but also there are some treatments like chemotherapy, some targeted therapies, and immunotherapy, okay? So now we are ready to understand the expert sessions on CLL. I hope when the doctors uh, will tell us, we are going to understand what they're talking about. That was the end of my little contribution to the doctors. Thank you so much. Wow. So we are early for this session. Yes. Right? That's oh. Good. Shall I see? Uh, Just now we mentioned about, oh, we mentioned about acute and chronic, you know. Um, in uh, CML, we know it's, is nine and this translocation of nine and uh, 22, so we know the exact cause of the disease. But in the acute phase with, uh, for the myeloid and also for the limpo, do we know um, the actual cause or not? Or is it unknown, you know? Is, it, is there, we know, do we know, have, do we have a series of markers of uh, um, genes, uh, mutation of genes? That, that we can pinpoint, you know, I was yeah. just wondering. For right. acute case, I mean, yeah. not the CLL. Yeah, thanks, for thanks, yeah. thanks, YC. I mean, um, with any form of acute leukemia, we actually utilize this information about the, the breakdown of the chromosomal abnormality. But we, apart from one particular kind of uh, acute myeloid leukemia, uh, we are not able to utilize this information. Uh, we use them um, to a certain extent to prognosticate, to, to plan ahead, you know, whether this group's going to do well or not. There are certain translocations, um, 1517, 
being one of them, inversion of chromosome 16, 821. There are a few markers that we, we, we can use. But unfortunately, apart from uh, one of the AML, we, we don't have the tools to actually utilize this. So um, the actual mechanism in, in terms of the progression of the disease, we don't have a magic bullet to actually offer this crew of people similarly like imatinib. Um, we still actually, um, th those information are very important for us, both in either ALL, A AML, or CLL, but they are not the, the basis of, in terms of the target for treatment except for one. Okay. Just want to, <coughs> no, I fully agree with Dr. Harris, just a little bit of some uh, supplement. Number one, all cancers are genetic diseases. Okay, the problem is not they are just not inherited from the parents, but somehow some of the cells got changes in the, in the genes. Mm -hmm. And so the cells become, you know, uncontrolled. Okay, and so that's cancer. Okay, now the CML is a very unique condition because this is probably more or less uh, the, the very rare occasions which we have one single problem that cause the disease. And so by targeting that single problem, we can control the disease. For the other acute leukemia that we know, or even the CLL, um, there is not, not clearly one single problem that caused the whole, so, say all the AML or the ALL, or even CLL. We believe that there may be a group of kind of uh, changes in the genes that can give rise to sort of this problem. And also, and especially in acute leukemia, like acute myeloid leukemia, we believe that actually when the patient has the, has the disease, it's actually more than one gene has been affected. It's multiple hits sometimes, okay? So um, therefore, it's difficult to give a simple solution. Now for ALL, this is this mutation that causes the disease. It may be many. And that's why from the scientific point of view, we try to look into all these sort of gene, genetic markers, what has changed, what has changed, and then we try to group them, and, and it's in some cases it works, okay? Like the uh, deletion 17 in CLL, we know it predicts a poor prognosis, okay? It seems that whenever, whenever the patient harbor this problem, the, even if the same disease of CLL, they do worse, okay? But there are other patients who don't have this problem, they still have CLL, okay? It's because the disease may be caused properly by multiple uh, sort of uh, genetic uh, abnormalities. Yeah, to add to that again, uh, talking about cytogenetics, um, it's good to have Philadelphia chromosome in CML, but if you were to carry that uh, chromosome in ALL, it's bad news. The same kind of mutation, the same kind of changes in, in the cytogenetic behave differently in different diseases. So in ALL, if you have Philadelphia chromosome positive, yes, you can actually use imatinib. But this group of patients usually do worse than ALL patients without Philadelphia chromosome. So even though you understand the gene, but the gene in different uh, setting and different disease actually behave differently, and targeting them might not actually solve the problem. Yeah. Uh, from the normal patients with no medical knowledge, can we say that the cure leukemia has no medicine, but chronic leukemia nowadays has the medicine already? Can we say that? We, unfortunately, even in CML, we don't have a cure for the CML. The only nearest to cure would be either you do a stem cell transplantation or you manage to suppress the production of the BCR-ABL to a level so low that you can actually uh, stop the imatinib. But even then, you still ha be harboring the disease. We are trying to translate this success to other cancer. Certain cancers, especially the solid organ ones, Surgery is only the way forward. We don't have that, that, um, that, um, that um, ability or that privilege to do in liquid malignancy because it comes out of the bone marrow. So that's why stem cell transplant as close as we get 
through to having a surgery and taking it out. So in CLL nowadays, the way that we treat it and to a certain extent the other um, malignancy is actually to uh, reduce the amount of cell and control it. But to eradicate it completely is still may not be possible. But okay. how about a cure, a cure mm. for leukemia? Yeah. In no yeah. So in acute leukemia, for instance, uh, you give uh, chemotherapy. What you're hoping is that chemotherapy will suppress the mutation, you know, the product of the abnormal, let's say, plus cell, leukemia cell, to a level that is very low that we cannot detect. But even in that circumstances, non-detection doesn't mean disease-free. So monitoring is very important in this patient. So, I think you have raised a very good, uh, good point about cure, okay? And in general, for chronic leukemias, or even sometimes lymphoma, we'll say, usually say that they are not curable. Now the reason is like this, okay? Imagine that, um, as Pat has mentioned, they sort of, they behave at least to a certain extent like a normal cells. So they look like normal cells, they behave like a normal cells. So when you get any treatment, okay, it's basically not able to differentiate, oh, this is the bad cell, this is a normal cell, let's kill this cell, and, and don't touch this cell. So a lot of time, okay, so because they more or less behave like a normal cell, so they're hiding inside the normal cell. So it's actually very eradicate the last single abnormal cells from the body. So that's why in chronic leukemia, CLL, in general, we say it's not curable. CML, if you use TKI, again, we usually say that it's not curable. But if you do a bone marrow transplant, yes, you can kill all the disease because you try to eradicate, eliminate all the bone marrow cells. Normal, abnormal, you get rid of them and you put in a new one. Now that's the potential cure. Now for acute leukemia, as I've mentioned, because the cells are actually more active in growing. Now all the chemotherapy that we give can only kill the growing cells. Because when they grow, they take in this cell, and then this, cell, uh, this, this drug can act on, because when they grow, they kill the cells. If they're just sitting like this, if you give chemo, the chemo come in and they leave, because I'm not growing. You see? That's why, okay, if you want the police to catch a thief, <laughs> where do you catch it? Yeah. At the time when he's trying to pickpocket, you catch him. If, if he's sitting in, in the car, in the bus, doing nothing, can you catch him? No. So that's the problem. So that's why acute leukemia sometimes, because the cells are so active, you know this bad cell, and you give the drug, okay, you catch them, okay, on the spot, you can kill them. You may be able to eradicate them. So acute leukemia, even, uh, even so, some more, so we call high-grade lymphoma, there's a chance of cure, okay, because with repeated causes, you can basically catch all of them, because you know that the, the chance of they getting out and, and you know, do something bad is, is high and is, there's, a, there's a good chance you can catch them. If you send enough police at different time point, patrolling, you can, you, can get them, you, you can get rid of them. Okay, but for those who are going slowly, I mean, you know, sitting here, you know, there's no way you can totally get rid of them. Okay, maybe this is the last yeah. question. My, mine is a, a part comment, part question. Uh, it used to be very simple for me in terms of uh, timing the two types of leukemia. One is chronic, the other one is moving so fast, that's why it's cured. Then we learned today it, it's myeloid and then uh, lymphocytic. Um, but I'm confused if CML in time will migrate into acute, then why is it that if we can suppress CML with TKIs, I did not see in the presentation of PAT um, CLL being suppressed by TKIs. It's the, 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 the cure apparently are, are uh, radiation and, and, and the other two types. Is it because of the genes? Uh, yeah. I, th I think it's um, purely uh, to a certain extent is to the lack of target because we can't use TKI in the setting of CLL. We don't have a target for us to block. So the treatment, which we'll elaborate later on, is not. It is actually uh, more crude than the sophistication of 
using TKI. In TKI, are very specific. We know the target and we can measure the response. But unfortunately, in CLL, we don't have that. Uh, we don't have that ability to target, and so we treat in the hope of all the cells are being killed. And we measure the success of treatment also rather crudely. We don't have a mechanism to say that yes, your your gene is suppressed by ten to the power of four like what we do in CML. Okay, so we don't have a target unfortunately. So the, the, I think the second part of your question is um, the progression to acute uh, to acute leukemia. Are, are you are you implying that you're worried that patient with CLL will eventually Transform into acute leukemia? Is that no, um, uh, CML. CML CML into a form of acute leukemia. Yeah. AML or yeah. ALL. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, maybe, maybe I can supplement yeah. on this. You know that when CML actually turn into a serrated phase and even blast phase like AML, the problem is that in apart from the Philadelphia chromosome, there are additional genetic problems. Is that the other additional genetic problem that drives the cells to grow faster, to behave more like an acute leukemia, and finally become a, an acute leukemia? So if the cells remain only have a single gene problem, the TKI usually works much better. Okay, so that's the the, the, the concept. As I've mentioned, for other say for CLL, most of the time it's not only, we cannot find a single gene that explain everything. So that's why it's difficult to find one drug to sort of treat everyone. Okay, this is different from C uh, CML. CML is is unique. Okay, it's always a good example how you know we target one one things and then we cure the disease. CLL you cannot. Even for acute leukemia, usually there are multiple genes being involved. Just like you know the blast phase, the AML phase of CML, there are more than one one target. So even for the patient with Philadelphia positive ALL. Even if you give TKI, it doesn't work usually that well because you know that there are some other targets. Okay, you, you block one target, don't worry, the others are working. Okay, so you still drive the cells growing. So that's the problem. So, but we have seen some light, okay, in the dark tunnel because over the years we have been trying to, to sort of, the history is that we're trying to um, uh, sort of improve our treatment. Okay, in the past we don't have chemotherapy, just like throwing bombs. Okay, you blow everything up. Okay, the bad, the good, okay, get rid of everything, okay? Now, nowadays we also, we got this targeted therapy and we improved that. Uh, I'm going to talk about that because we have some monoclonal antibody, they try to deplete a group of cells, okay, like the lymphocyte, that helps the disease a little bit. And nowadays we also got some even more targeted drug, more or less a little bit closer to the TKI, that we sort of block a specific uh, point, okay, in the growth of the cell. And that helps you, you know, control the disease and in a much smarter way rather than, you know, curing everything, okay? So we are actually making progress even in CLL. And hopefully in the next few years when more and more these new drugs coming, we know how we should combine this with other drugs and hopefully can offer a much long-lasting sort of remission to this patient. But, it, but even, even then, uh, if I may, may say, uh, the the actual target is not as specific as in CML. In CML, you can see the target very, very clearly and you go for that. But in CLL, we are still in the process of understanding whether there is actually a common trigger or at the end of the day, it's a common, uh, a, a common uh, effect in the end. So where is the bottleneck? That's what we are looking for. Okay. Can I ask just one question before we go? Because I, I think that uh, I didn't touch in lymphomas, but uh, we learned today CLL most of the time come from the B cell. And I know that the lymphomas also come from the B cell, so maybe it would be good to explain the difference between leukemia and lymphoma. Oh, and the, the, the CLL and, um, and uh, the lymphoma, they are related, there's no doubt about it. <coughs> But the way that they differ is mainly to the degree of how mature they are. So as the analogy that uh, Dr. Wong mentioned just now, um, the cell goes to school and then they acquire certain knowledge. Lymphoma, lymphoma cell, they're more mature. They acquired the knowledge already. They, they graduated high school maybe. Then they, 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 they wanted to, to become deviant. <laughs> okay. uh, so they're, 
the, 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 the way that they behave is slightly different. The cell marker that they have is a bit different. But in CLL, there are certain subgroup of patients that can develop lymphoma, which I'm sure that we will touch upon later. It is actually related. Uh, I think in general, uh, C uh, lymphoid leukemia and also lymphoma, okay, they are grouped under the big umbrella of what we call lymphoproliferative disorder, lymphocyte proliferation disorder, okay. And sometimes we can even some find some relatives between these two conditions, like in CLL. There's actually a, um, the relative is that in, in the lymph node, it's called small lymphocytic lymphoma because they're actually more or less the same cells. And as I've mentioned, these cells, they were born in the bone marrow, they got trained in lymph node, and then they take care, and, and then they come out in circulation to work, okay? Something in the blood to work. So it depends on where you find them, the abnormal cell, where they actually stay. If they stay mainly in the blood, mainly in the bone marrow, you call them leukemia, because leukemia is the cancer of the blood. If you find them mainly staying in the lymph nodes, okay, staying in the school, not going out, you call them lymphoma. That's the case. 